and uh, our last uh, talk was George Lambrick talking about the Blackfriars. Um, it's uh, it's very pleasing this evening to be focusing in on one of uh, on one of the kind of key people of, of the period, and it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor um, Hannah Smithson, uh, an experimental psychologist, and Dr. Giles Kester. A uh, historian from uh, Durham, and Tanya you're from the university. Uh, and uh, it will be interesting, I think, your, your overlap, I understand, is around the Auditor University project. Yep. Thank you. Very much. Um, well, it's a, a great uh, privilege and pleasure to be here and to present somebody with intimate connections to the Greyfriars uh, buildings um, and somebody who has. Uh, we were mentioning is associated with our project why you would have a psychologist and a historian together. Well, I could think of people in our department of history who might be with a psychologist, but uh, why we put ourselves together academically um, is to explore Grosser Test and particularly his scientific writings. So as we go on, we'll talk about who he was, why he's important to us. I'm sure for an Oxford audience I don't need to do too much, but we'll explain why he's so interesting to us, and then we'll talk about the project, and what we are, and what we're doing. So, the later works of science, in inverted commas, and we'll think about what that means for the 13th century as much as the 21st, um, works that Gossetist is writing them up to and just into the period when he's lecturing to the Franciscans. So there is a nice crossover with his period uh, in Greyfriars, or teaching at Greyfriars. So I should say too, the Audit Universe project uh, is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, I have to say that, um, and very generously, so we recently got a big grant which allows us to do what I'll tell you that we're doing. But before that, uh, a little background on Grossetus and the Franciscans. As I'm sure you know, he was appointed 1229 or 1230 to be the first lector to the early Franciscan community as it established itself in Oxford. He knew quite a lot of the mendicants, both Dominicans and Franciscans. So before his lecture, he was particularly taken with Jordan of Saxony, who is St. Dominic's successor as the uh, Minister General for the Dominican Order. And later in his life, Grossetest writes to Jordan quite a lot about the help that the mendicants are giving him in his diocese. But it was Jordan's lectures, three lectures in particular, that Grossetest heard when he was in Oxford that really seemed to cause a change of, of mind and a change of heart and open Grossetest to the attractions of the mendicant order. These are the religious orders that, that live by begging. Um, Jordan's appearance in Oxford seems to have prompted a number of the community, particularly amongst the theological uh, faculty, to adopt the mendicant lifestyle. So Adam Marsh, Grossetest's great friend and interlocutor, um, from the northeast, actually, uh, he had a, his uh, father was um, uncle, sorry, was a bishop of Durham, and Grossetest and Adam are both inscribed in the Liber Vitae, the Book of Memory, at uh, Durham Cathedral. But Adam becomes a Franciscan at this point. Grossetest doesn't, which is interesting. He seems to have had some issues with living by begging, but he really does appreciate uh, the Franciscans for what they are. Thomas of Eccleston, uh, the chronicler of the uh, arrival of the Franciscans in Oxford gives great uh, presence to Grossetest's role in establishing the community and giving them in particular a proper theological basis for their mission. So as I said, when he's lectured to the Franciscans, Grossetest has already started his mastership in theology. He is just finishing off his scientific adventure. So this is in medieval terms his studies in the quadrivium, the mathematical arts. So we're really at a very interesting point where he's um, really quite an experienced administrator, theologian, thinker, and this is quite a, uh, a period where he's exploring lots of different ideas and how to apply them in a number of different fields. He writes, if we take Evelyn Mackey's point of view, which I think we should, the Chateau de Moor, his famous, uh, quite long, allegorical poem on creation um, in Anglo-Norman, probably for the Franciscan community. So, this is a text which has a considerable afterlife, and it shows Grossetest's great range. This is Anglo-Norman, he's also writing in Latin, he's a, a real polymath, as we'll see. And he has continued connections with the Franciscans when he becomes bishop. He writes to 
uh, of Lincoln, which he does in 1235. He writes to Gregory IX uh, in 1238. There's a sort of crisis in the Franciscan order at this point. There were lots of crises in the Franciscan order, to be honest. Among us English, he says, the friars are responsible for incalculably great benefits, for they illuminate our whole land with the brilliant light of their preaching and teaching. The lucent metaphors are very striking here. He quite often talks about the Franciscans in this terminology of enlightenment, of conversion, of foundation. So this is an important element because it's so central to how he understands the physical universe and how he talks about the theology and how he knows things. He needs the Franciscans too because he's running an enormous diocese when he's Bishop of Lincoln. Just in some numbers, Lincoln Diocese is eight counties, it has one bishop, eight archdeacons, 77 rural deans and 2,000 parishes. So this is why the Dominicans and the Franciscans, who Grossetest absorbs into his household, are really vital to him in his pastoral mission as bishop to educate his own clergy and also to take confession and penance which are becoming key features of medieval religious life after the reforms of 1215. Forgive the title of the slide, I just couldn't resist it. <laughs> so, Grey Friars is obviously very important to Grossetest in terms of his role in helping the community to establish itself and we should remember the community is very early. Um, it also then is incredibly important in preserving uh, Rossetes' legacy. So his library he gives to the Grey Friars community in Oxford, not to the uh, cathedral at Lincoln. This is probably because he had splenetically bad relationships with the chapter in Lincoln. Um, and it's a jolly good thing because the library would have presumably moulded away in Lincoln. In the Franciscan hands, this is at the epicentre of interesting theological developments for the rest of the Middle Ages. So we have this connection which has been looked at. William of Alec, <coughs> lector to the Franciscans in the early 14th century, dies in 1333, talks in a dispute with um, an opponent. So this opponent has taken some words of Grossetest and said this is on a, a debate on eternity, and says that Grossetest had said something and this was wrong. And William has this rejoinder, which is a very interesting insight into Grosset's methods, into how they're categorised, and in how his works were surviving. So these words are written in his own hand, so Grosset's own hand, in the margins of his copy of Aristotle's Physics. He did not expand this work formally or completely as he did the posterior analytics, so this has a slightly lesser status, if you like. But when any notable imaginatio came to his mind, and we'll think about imagination in a few slides' time. He wrote it down so that he would not forget it. So he wrote many scraps, which are not all authoritative, i.e. these are opinion, they're not authoritative statements. They are all preserved in the Franciscan Library at Oxford, and I have seen them with my own eyes. They must be distinguished from his authoritative sayings in his comments on Dennis, so that's Pseudodemus, the Oracle Guide, or in his Hexameron, the commentary on the Six Days of Creation, or on the posterior analytics of uh, Aristotle. So there's actually, this is a wonderfully packed description, but that wonderful description, particularly if you're thinking about location, of how William of Anik is still encountering Grosseteste's handwriting, his notes, these schedules, they're not bound up into, into codex volumes yet, they're still all over the place. And we get another record, uh, 150 years old, so Thomas Gascoigne, who was an indefatigable um, collector of Grosseteste looking for Grosseteste's handwriting in the 1430s through 1450s give us similar comments to William that he's, he's seen Grosseteste's handwriting and he's seen these notes and their collections. So the Franciscan community at Oxford has a very important role in preservation. And I think for Grosseteste's reception that means that although he doesn't have a continuity, at least there are moments where this connection is looked at and is important. So just a bit on the Ordered Universe project. As I said, psychologist, historian, actually we're a lot more than this. This is a fusion project between um, modern science and humanities scholars uh, focusing on the Middle Ages. So this is just a, a brief selection. We're an international group in two of medieval specialists on the one hand, Latinists, theologians, historians, classicists, and then physicists. We even have a couple of engineers. Um, uh, we have vision science, uh, we have mathematics and cosmology. What we're doing is to look at Grosseteste's scientific canon. I'll explain what we're actually doing in, in detail on that school. How we do it is simply to meet with the text. So we all sit down together 
for days at a time, normally four days, and start reading through the text from the beginning and get into the end. Here's a public day we ran in Durham last year, so that's a project that we, we take, uh, take on the road quite often. But this is, in a sense, the locus for the collaborative project that we do. We read, we edit, we translate, and then we comment on these wonderful works of Gossett and it really does take all of us to explore the world of his scientific imagination. Just before we do that, um, a little detail on the man himself. And there are some interesting um, ways in which his life story plays out and some interesting gaps that we have to fill in. This is a very pixelated image from a manuscript that used to belong to Durham Cathedral Library in the Middle Ages. Born about 1170 or 1175, uh, in East Anglia, possibly Suffolk, and uh, dies in 1253. He, we're not quite sure where he starts his learning, possibly in Lincoln. Um, in 1195, he's appointed to the Bishop of Hereford's household, uh, William de Vere. This is very interesting for his scientific works. Hereford, in the late 1190s, in fact, Hereford through the 12th century, is a centre for mathematical learning, in particular computers, the, the medieval science of time, which is how you calculate Easter but it incorporates a massive array of other subjects. Astronomy is vital to this. Computers runs on the, the rhythms of the sun and the moon, so you need accurate data in order to calculate the divisions of time. So being in Hereford is an interesting choice of Rossiter's. William de Vere has the, uh, well, dies in 1198, and his household dissolves, so that's um, the last point we hear about Grosseteste. Until 1225, except he's involved in a few legal cases in the 12 teens. 1225, he re-emerges fully. He's made rector of Abbotsley in Lincoln Diocese. Um, he's made archdeacon of Lincoln a bit later. 1228-9, he's lectured to the Franciscans. As I said, this is about the same time that he's shifting from the liberal arts to theology. He's made bishop of Lincoln in 1235. A very active, extremely active bishop. Um, he attends to his great pleasure the First Council of Lyon. The papacy has had to um, temporarily move itself to Lyon from Rome. Um, Grossetest attends the council and then returns to the papacy at Lyon and gives them a great big sermon on how corrupt they are, which may be one reason he wasn't gallant. In 1253, he, he dies. So he's actually quite old. This is a very full, rich life. He's a thinker. Uh, as he said, liberal arts, then theologian, then bishop, he's a politician, he's an administrator. This is a polymath and a very active person within 13th century political and intellectual life. A very beautiful mind. His medieval reception is interesting. So we get um, an image of Grosseteste as uh, the great administrator. That's one strand of medieval writing. The Franciscans, in particular, emphasise his role as a theologian, so authors like Thomas of Eccleston. Um, other Franciscan writers like Roger Bacon remember him as a scientist, so this is another strand of historical memory, if you like, of Grossetest. The great mathematician is particularly um, lauded for his uh, mathematical abilities. And then there is another strand of Grossetest, the politician or ecclesiastical politician. This is the Grossetest who's picked up by Wycliffe in his great diatribe against the papers. He's an extremely interesting person to try and study, though. This medieval perception history is written up, obviously, after his death. We don't know much about what he's doing between 1200 and 1225, which is precisely the point when he's writing these wonderful scientific books. We know that he's very interested in pastoral care. He's a very important person <coughs> in that reformation of the 13th century church, a notable theologian. But it's the science or what we call the science, are these uh, mathematical treatises that we're interested in in particular. So Grosseteste, the scientist, really, it is a strand that you can find, as I said, in the medieval reception, but it's particularly in the very late 19th century and in particularly 20th century when Grosseteste, the scientist, is picked up again in scholarship. And it's this man, Ludwig Bauer, who's a sort of cheerleader for that. A number of very influential scholars through the 20th century, so Ludwig Bauer, Francis Thompson, um, Thompson, Alistair Crombie, uh, D.C. Dent, James McAvoy, and then Chetunia Panty, who's part of our Orders Universe group. So that's just a conspectus of scholars through the 20th century for whom the scientific works 
being very interesting. What are they? Well, we'll talk about some of the problems with them. But the scientific works are basically what he's writing between about 1200 and about 1228. More or less in sequence, I'll run through them. So we have the generation of sounds on the sphere. So this is the sphere of the world and how you can work out the stars as a result. The computer's correctorious. He writes his own treatise on how to calculate dates <coughs> and time. Here's a manuscript illumination from the 14th century copy of the De Sera. 1220, we're moving on to other phenomena uh, in, the, in the heavens, so on, on comets, on the impressions of the elements. He then writes on the emotions of the uh, uh, super-celestial bodies. 1225, a key moment. He's absorbing different works of Aristotle here. He writes his amazing treatise on light. This is the one that seems to presage the Big Bang. He has this treatise. He's trying to explain the body of the universe. How does body come to be? Aristotle's universe has no beginning and no end. Aristotle needs his universe to have a beginning. So he says it must be light that carries matter and form, and it must be light. The universe starts from a single point of light, which expands instantly to form a sphere. Our scientists get very excited about that one, and we've got reasons. The treatise on colour, we'll talk about that uh, in detail a bit later on. As well as these treatises, these range from 400 words, so they're quite small, um, very complex to about nine pages, so they're not massive works. These are very tight explorations of a particular topic. He does write big ones, so the, the commentary on the posterior analytics is a standard text. He's the first one to comment on this incredibly important work of Aristotle's for epistemology and how you think about science and knowledge. And this is a standard text then, well into the 14th and early 15th centuries. The physics, we've already had the name of Alex, uh, third it, but this was mostly a note for them but it would have been wonderful to have been in the classroom. Uh, then his final sections on science, the, the great treatise on geometry, on lines and angles, which is one of the last in the sequence that our group is going to look at, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and then on the nature of places. And finally, in this period where he's then lecturing to the Franciscans, he writes his phenomenal treatise on the rainbow of the Hannibal. So, one issue is that we have an edition from 1912 with some manuscript problems, and I'll talk about those in a minute. The other is that these treatises are highly mathematical. They come from the bit of the medieval curriculum, which everybody does to start with, um, and is really focusing on maths. So, actually, these days that requires an interdisciplinary team to do it. Um, I have stopped doing maths at anything other than I can add the... Well, I can just about add when I'm in the shops. Um, but this is really complex stuff, um, and it's impressed even Richard Bauer, who's probably the, the leading mathematician on our team, a computational cosmologist. So Grosser Test is working with a highly, highly mathematical uh, system. So, this is what we deal with. This is the treatise on colour, or bits of it. Um, not all the manuscripts are in this condition. This is a manuscript from the Cotton Library, um, which suffered a massive fire in the early 18th century. But what we have to do is to move from this to that. So this is the Treatise on Colour in the earliest manuscript, which is now held in Madrid, but it was an English, probably Oxford manuscript from about 1270. So we have to get from there to there. This is the humanities bit on the whole, although we discovered in our collaborative readings that actually reading it together and teasing out the meaning of the text helps to sharpen up the, not just the translation, but also the editorial process. And I will talk about a couple of very key examples of that. You can see why we chose the Decor Ring to start our project with, because it's the shortest, but it's actually extremely complicated and extremely detailed and a very beautiful text and theme. Ludwig Bauer made his edition in 1912. He only knew about five or six manuscripts. There are at least 13 for some of the treatises. For the De Sfera, there's over 54. So since 1912, there's been quite an expansion of our knowledge of these, of these texts. So part of the exercise is simply to, to do a, a new edition to take on board that, that new knowledge. But it's much more than that. The translation is collaborative, and then we look at the text both from a contextual point of view, so thinking about where Gossetus is deriving his sources from, what his texts are saying in the context of his own 
the zone period, but we also look at it from a modern scientific point of view. So what thoughts is he having? What is the logic of the treatise? He's talking about natural phenomena, phenomena that still exist. Colour is as real in the 21st century as it was in the 13th. So, I'll talk about the text of archaeology um, a little bit, just to show the richness of Rossiter's text uh, from a humanities perspective, from a, from a textual point of view. He is a phenomenal reader, an early user of new text, Aristotelian texts which have been unknown to the West, known to the um, Islamic world. So Grossetus is absorbing both the Aristotelian texts from the great translation movement in Spain in the 12th century, scholars working um, mostly in Jewish households it seems actually, this is where Christians meet uh, Muslim sculpture. Um, so both Aristotle and other ancient thinkers but also their Islamic and Jewish commentators from the early Middle Ages. So we know, if we look at the De Cunore, the use of the word perspicuum, this is Aristotle. He's got hold of Aristotle's De Anima and the De Sensu. For the De Luca, this is an absolute compendium of sources, but in the Aristotelian sense, the Cairo at London, the heavens and the earth, the physics, he's got the text on the generation of corruption. De Iride, this is just a conspectus of the text which we're mostly talking about. He now knows Aristotle's Epimeteorology and on the generation of animals. If we look at the Arabic side, and this is where it's really interesting because his texts help us to date when these Arabic thinkers are making their way into the Western canon, they can always show evidence of reading the great commentary on the metaphysics of Aristotle. De Luque shows us the same thing. The De Iride, we start to shift the word. So when De Canore uses the word perspicuum in the De Iride, about four years later, he's using the word diaphanum for the same phenomenon. And I will tell you what that is. Which is another commentary by Averroes on the De Anima. It's probably circulating in 1225. So Grossetest has got his hands on the latest stuff. This is a very capacious mind indeed. And in millions of other sources, well, not quite millions, but a, a massive array. This is just from the De Luque. He knows his Avicenna. He knows Avicenna. These are the Latinized names of Islamic and Jewish philosophers. al charges they mostly begin there. He knows Euclid. He knows Alexander Necker, a, a near contemporary of his. And he knows the sources from the patristic writings of the early Christian church, particularly Augustine. De Musica was a big treatise that he deals with for the generation of sounds. If we just look at the De Media as well, he's got a lot of the optical works from the ancient world, such as Sunil and Euclid's Capsophica. So from a humanities point of view, this is an incredibly rich, um, vibrant world that you encounter when you read these texts. William Panic, though, made a good point about the status of Gossett's scientific work. So what is he writing this, this for? Well, partly because he's pursuing the first part of the medieval curriculum. So this is what you do. You do the trivium, which is about the arts of persuasion, logic, grammar, and rhetoric, and then you do the mathematical arts, astronomy, music, and so forth. He gives quite an important status to what he calls imagination. This is not what we mean by imagination. Imagination is an important part in how medieval thinkers think we know. It's the fixing of an object. So imagination is actually the opposite of what we think it's not fantasy, it's actually real. This is how you fix it in your head, and this is how you're able to interpret it. So, this is um, from his Hexameron book. He's telling us why ancient cosmology got the universe so wrong. This made them imagine before any given time, it's because they have a bad imagination. Another time, just as the fantasy imagines a place outside any given place, and a space outside any given space, and so on to infinity. To cleanse oneself of this error, then, one can only cleanse the affection of one's mind and its love of temporal things, so that the glance of the mind, untouched by images, can go beyond time and grasp the simplicity of eternity, in which there is no extension of before and after, and from which all time and every before and every after proceed. You can see why this is a bit of a nightmare to translate. <laughs> but this important notion of imagination the Gossetus gives to his scientific writings, and an important feature to the moral status of the investigator. You can't do good science, or well, you can't do good investigations if you are living in Oregon. Observation as well. The treatises are a bit beguiling, actually, as to what he's really doing. So, observation, he gives a, a, a great status to it. He can imagine, he can fix Aristotle's depiction of the sphere. So, although he can't see the universe, he comes up with a perfectly rational explanation for it. 
And he also knows certain things. He knows, as they say, this picture from Poussin de Metz, who's about two decades later, who knows that the world is round. So he uses both the imagination in the medieval sense and observation in his treatises. Experiment and experience. This is a long winning debate, and it's been one since um, Alistair Crombie in the 1950s. De Grosset has to do experiments. Well, actually, what Crombie meant by experiments is probably the key question. Um, but of course, it is the origins of experimental science kind of gives it away. Um, how you translate experimental is an interesting question. It's perfectly reasonable and probably better to translate it as experience rather than experiment, given how loaded a term experiment is in modern science. This is the end of the treatise on colour. What is understood in this way about the essence of colours and their multiplication becomes apparent not only by reason but also by experience. I'll translate that experiment, but experience is, is, I think, more pertinent to those who thoroughly understand the depth of the principles of natural science and optics. So, that's from the so an interesting question of the text, and again, it doesn't quite give you enough for us to conclude that he is doing experiments. He's certainly a keen observer. He's a very, very good mathematician. And there might be a sense in which his experimental vocabulary is about mathematics more than it's about doing an experiment in the, the lab as well. So with that, I'll hand over to Hannah, who will tell us about the two judices on colour and on the way. So, um, one of the things that we're doing in this Ordered Universe project is to think about medieval science. And so that's a, a little bit of a challenging statement, because the overwhelming um, view of most science graduates is that science started um, in the Renaissance and there wasn't much in the Dark Ages um, happening in terms of scientific understanding and scientific thought. We're really focusing on um, Grosseteste's treatise, treatises on natural phenomena. So he has a passion to explain um, natural phenomena around him. And Two that I'll talk about now are uh, his treatise on colour, De Colore, and his treatise on the rainbow, De Iride. Um, and I think you'll see in the description that I give you of our understanding of what he was writing, um, he really is grappling with concepts and ideas that we would appreciate very much in um, a scientific framework today. So, in terms of the history of science, just to put this in a little bit of context, so these were written 800 years ago. Um, and if we think about key scientists who've um, played a role in our modern understanding of colour and the rainbow, for example, this is 500 years before the writings of Newton <coughs> and 600 years before the writings of Thomas Young, who came up with um, a theory of human colour perception. Um, so. There's a large temporal disconnect between what's been written here and our modern theories. So what was the prevailing view of colour at the time that Grosseteste was writing? Well, he really inherited Aristotle's framework for colour. And Aristotle had a one-dimensional framework for colour, a colour line that goes between black and white and aligns various colours um, in between those two extremes. In the De Colore, Grosseteste opens with this sentence, so colour is light embodied in a diaphanous material. And then the following 396 words basically try to explain what he means by that phrase. So he says that um, colour has three qualities, and each of those qualities um, he describes with a bipolar term. And he uses these Latin pairings. So he says colour can either be purum or impurum, roughly translated as pure or impurum. Can either be clara or obscura, bright and dim, or multa or pauca, copious or scarce. And he says that purum impurum is a property of the material. So this is the material in which light is in, uh, colour is embodied. Um, and these two, clara and obscura, multipalca, are properties of light. So this is tantalising to a modern colour scientist, 
um, because there are good reasons now why we understand that biological human colour perception is three-dimensional in some sense. But it would be way too much of a leap to go from this list of three bipolar qualities to say he understood anything about um, the, our modern understanding of three-dimensional colour perception. But in the De Colore, he does go a lot further than this. So he starts to explain what he means by these things. So he says, for example, if you want to describe whiteness, you have to use three terms. So you have to use the terms multa, clara, and purum. So if you were imagining, and the easiest way to imagine this is to borrow a sort of geometric description where we put these three axes as the three axes of Cartesian space. So we could use a cube like this. So we could say there's variation between impurum and purum, there's variation between clara and obscura, and multa and palca. And to get to whiteness, you have to be at the top of the multa palca axis, at the purum extreme of the impurum purum axis, and at the clara extreme of the clara obscura axis. And conversely, blackness is at the opposite extremes of all of those axes. So it would plot at this corner down here. He then has to relate this um, sort of three-dimensional bipolar space to Aristotle's statement that there are seven colours. So how does he get there? He says there are seven colours close to whiteness, no more, no fewer. And he gets there by describing <coughs> combinatorial manipulation of these three bipolar qualities. So imagine starting at this point, which we've identified as white, and he says when two of these three, two of these elements remain, diminution of any third element can occur. So if you're thinking about moving around a particular representation of colour, he's talking about moving along one axis at a time. So if you move along this axis here, um, you're holding constant, you're at the maximum point in height, and at, you're at the maximum point um, in depth this way, but you're coming in um, along the dimension towards the front face of the cube here. And he says, when only two of these three elements remains, diminution of the remaining two will occur. So in that case, you'd be moving diagonally along the faces of this cube. Or there will be diminution of all three elements at once. So you move in a direction along the diagonal of the cube. So by counting these possible combinatorial um, combinations of these three qualities, he comes to um, a rationale for why there are seven colours close to whiteness. Now, I said this was interesting for a modern colour scientist. I'm based in the experimental psychology department. My research area is human colour perception. And modern colour science uses three-dimensional spaces to describe colour. So you may have seen these sorts of um, displays on a computer graphics system, for example. And they let you manipulate the colour of the um, patch that you're presenting on the screen by changing the amount of red, green and blue in the output of your monitor. So it gives you three ways of manipulating colour. If you set them all to zero, you see a colour that's black. If you set them all to their maximum, so 255 in this case, you see a colour that's white. And if you set them to some intermediate values, you can navigate through all the possible colours that can be produced on your computer monitor. So there is a very fundamental reason why you only need three um, parameters to describe colour. And that's a biological reason. It's a biological reason because there are only three types of colour receptor in our retinas. Um, and I don't know whether anybody looked at me earlier when I came in, but this afternoon, one of the things I was doing was taking pictures of my own retina. Um, so I have one dilated pupil in my right eye. So if you think I look a bit strange, it's because I've got a very dilated pupil in my right eye. Anyway, um, but there are other three-dimensional colour spaces that can be used. Um, people might have come across the hue, saturation and value colour space. And you can transform between different three-dimensional spaces. So if Grosseteste's understanding of colour was touching on this very fundamental um, 
limit of human colour perception. Why is that not sort of in popular parlance? Why is it not popularly discussed that Grosser test had this huge influence on our understanding of the um, perceptual experience of colour? And I think one of the important things there is that these manuscripts were, the, the treatise and um, manuscripts that survive are very old, and there are textual problems in understanding their, in their transmission. So here's a um, stemma codicium of the manuscripts that we have available um, based on a particular archetypal manuscript that we believe must have existed. And the ones that are in existence now are the ones that are highlighted here. And when we started working, um, and in fact the most popular um, edition of Grosseter's work really focused, had been focused on the um, later manuscripts. We were very lucky to be able to get hold of two of these early manuscripts. One that's held in Madrid and one that's held um, in the Bodleian. So if you look at the later nine manuscripts, when he describes um, whiteness and blackness, there's this section of text. So he says, um, so light, so bright and copious light in a pure diaphanous medium is whiteness. So he's describing the three characteristics, bright, copious, and pure. And then scarce light in an impure diaphanous medium is blackness. He's only given two parameters there. So that's lux pauca in perspicuo in puro negrido est. Um, I'm not, not a Latinist. Um, and my reading of Latin is very much um, of the sort of Winnie the Pooh style. I can read it if somebody tells me what the, what the letters mean. Um, so in this description, he's not it appears giving us a full account of blackness that would be consistent with this three-dimensional scheme that he's set up. So to identify this point, you have to have something that's Pauka, which he's got, something that's Impurum, which he's got, but he's missed out the description um, of where he should be along this axis. There's no statement that the light also needs to be obscure. But if we look at the two earliest manuscripts, and this was a wonderful moment in the collaboration because we sent the humanities scholars to the library in Madrid and got a very excited email saying, when we looked really carefully in these two manuscripts, there it was, there was the missing obscura. So by thinking about understanding the content of these treatises, it's possible to um, improve um, our methodology for working out the content of the treatises. And this is something that would have been uncovered um, through careful manuscript work. But there are nine manuscripts that say one thing and two that say something else. So it might have been difficult to decide which way to go. One of the important things is that by thinking more about the content, we can help guide that decision. And it really is a collaborative process that you <coughs> need to include the evidence from the manuscript tradition, but also the more we can do to think ourselves back to understanding the points he was trying to make um, and the content of what he was trying to say, the more we'll find it easier to understand and make good editions and translations. So another um, example is that he says, <coughs> once he's identified whiteness and seven colours emanating from whiteness, he also says there are seven colours emanating from blackness. And in some of the manuscripts that we're reading, he said, well, that's seven and seven, and that gives us nine colours in total. <laughs> we thought, hang on a minute, there's something, something not quite right here. And again, careful looking at the manuscripts, suggested that what had happened was that originally he had written 14, so seven and seven is 14, that's good. But it's at a time where there's a... Um, change between using Arabic numerals and Roman numerals. So imagine writing a 1 and a 4, and perhaps writing them a little bit like this, and then a scribe reading that and interpreting that as an I and an X. Translate, 
then writing that as nine, which we've now novum, which we've now translate as nine. So a very easy um, change between a one and an x, or, sorry, a one and a four, looking like um, an i and an x, can lead to something that makes you think this this treatise really doesn't make any sense at all. Um, but understanding more about its content helps us to um, understand these ambiguities a bit more subtly. Um, another um, point, which now is not so much about um, understanding the content of the manuscript, but more about translating the material. So, when he talks about seven colours emanating from whiteness and seven colours emanating from blackness, he says that they meet in the middle. And previously people had thought, well that's similar to Aristotle's one-dimensional line. You've got things coming from white here, things coming from black here, and they'll meet in the middle. But if you look very carefully at the Latin, there's a perfectly good interpretation of um, the text based on um, the grammatical usage in the um, treatise that suggests that the seven colours from white and the seven colours from black meet in some kind of middle space, like the fingers of two hands coming together, and not necessarily at a single point. Um, so one of the things we've thought about in that translation is to translate a middle space rather than they come to meet in a, in a point. Okay, so we get to the end of the treatise on um, colour and we're a bit stuck because we haven't really got a proper um, translation or a proper interpretation of these Latin pairings. What does he really mean by the variation between multa pauper purum impurum clara obscura? And I think one thing that's very striking about the De Colore treatise is it's a treatise on colour, but it mentions no colour terms. So he never says, you know, there are red things, there are green things, there are lime green things. He also never mentions any objects that have a diagnostic colour. So he doesn't say red like blood, or he doesn't say, you know, Malta Pauca is like the variation between, I don't know, leaves in springtime and leaves in the autumn. It's not, it's not like that. But there is a treatise that he wrote later which is the treatise on the rainbow. And the first part of that treatise basically takes us through some geometric optics. But the final part of that treatise returns to this idea of colour, and he discusses the colours that are available in the rainbow. And he uses the terminology that he had set up in the De Colore treatise. And so he returns to these pairings of terms. So he says, by multipalca, I mean the variety of colour in the different parts of one and the same rainbow. So if you imagine looking at a rainbow, he's talking about the variety of colour that you get as you look at different angles of elevation in this rainbow. He says by purum impurum, I mean the difference in the colours between one rainbow and another arising from the properties of the recipient diaphanous medium. If you think about rainbows you may have seen, you see different types of rainbows. And um, on a misty day compared to a thunderstormy day, the rainbow that you might see in a thunderstorm is often much brighter, much more saturated in terms of the colours that are available. A rainbow seen in mist is often a little bit washed out. It doesn't look quite as bold and striking as the thunderstorm rainbow. And one of the things that happens between the mist and the thunderstorm is the, that the droplet size changes. And there's a physical reason why there's a difference in the colours produced by those two um, atmospheric conditions. And by Clara Obscura, he says he means the difference in colours between one rainbow and another arising from the brightness and dimness of the luminosity impressed upon it. So now we have a chance to um, obtain a real sort of physical translation of these terms. And so we thought about how we might explore this a little bit further. Um, and we considered um, travelling around, taking photos of rainbows. It would have been a wonderful research. <laughs> um, but instead we thought we'd try to quantify it more carefully. 
So we built a computer model of the different types of colour that you can get in a rainbow. And so essentially that allowed us to explore the possible space of colours that you can make through natural rainbows. So I'll take you briefly through that project. So one way to, that we've chosen to represent colours is in a modern colour space. And it's a colour space where we use the vertical axis to mean the variation between light and dark. And we have two colour axes, one that goes between green and red, and one that goes between yellow and blue. So that's just the way in which I'll represent the colours that we've um, calculated. And this is essentially the output of our model. So we start with just two parameters, because that was the easiest way to start. So we say one of our parameters is the droplet radius. So it's the difference between mist and thunderstorm with large raindrops. <coughs> and the other one we take is the scattering angle. So he talked about the variety of um, colour within a single rainbow. So that's essentially the angle of elevation um, as you're looking up to the rainbow. And so lines through here would be a rainbow that's produced with a particular droplet radius and this is the range of colours that you see. So we can consider one particular rainbow here. And so there's the familiar set of rainbow colours, so red, orange, yellow, green, etc. And you might see down here there's a hint of those colours repeating again. And if anybody knows something about rainbows, you can get supernumerary arcs where you get additional um, repetition of the colours in a rainbow um, below the arc. So if we plot those in this space, they begin to form this spiral. So this is the space, looking down on this from above, we've got the difference between um, red and green across here, and between yellow and blue across here. And so this set of colours begins to span the colours um, the variety of colour that we perceptually see. Now if we do that for all possible rainbows at different droplet sizes, we begin to fill in this space of possible colours that we can see. And in fact, this is um, plotted in a modern three-dimensional colour space. And these two properties actually plot out a surface. They represent a surface in this three-dimensional space. So, just by describing um, the different rainbows that are produced by different droplet sizes and different colours within a rainbow, you can pinpoint a position on this surface. So one way to think about that would be to say, if you wanted to specify a particular colour and you wanted to use Grosseteste's scheme to do it, he's basically given you a coordinate system. So you could specify this particular colour here by saying which of the blue lines you're on and which of the red lines you're on. And that would pinpoint the coordinate position of that colour. So he's given us a scheme for specifying and navigating around a colour space. So these are two of those parameters. He mentioned a third. So he said, I'm talking about the difference in rainbows um, at um, different points of the sun's elevation. And he explicitly talks about sunrise and sunset. So one of the things that changes as the sun sets is that the light becomes redder as the sun's light coming to the observer has been filtered through more and more of the atmosphere. So we can model this process. And if we do that, um, we take this single spiral and we sweep it through the colour volume. So now we've got three coordinates blue coordinate, colours within a rainbow, the red coordinate, colours between rainbows with different droplet sizes, and the black coordinate, colours between rainbows with different sun elevations. And it doesn't let him navigate the whole of perceptual colour space, there are some bits missing that his coordinate system doesn't reach. But the variety of colour that is found in a rainbow is quite a good way of describing the range of possible colours that human observers can see. And it gives him a scheme for understanding and manipulating and <coughs> describing those colours to other people, perhaps. So, in a way, we can think about our modern 3D colour space, and we can think about how 
this rainbow colour space also serves a similar purpose, that it fills in the set of possible colours that we can see. So, one of the things in the project is this strong interplay <coughs> between um, expertise in the humanities, expertise in um, <coughs> reading and um, transcribing medieval Latin, um, knowledge of the language and the inherited intellectual frameworks of the time, um, but also thinking about the content of what's being described. And, for example, in the De Colore, the description of colour is very geometrical, it is very mathematical, and that kind of geometric um, training will have been something that was very much part of Grosseteste's curriculum. On its own, in these treatises, it would be very difficult to make interpretations of what was being said simply from the linguistic and contextual information. One of the things that's helped us kind of make a, some kind of interpretation of what he really meant by um, multa pauca, clara obscura, purum impurum, is to refer to these physical things, the physical rainbows, that he will have seen and that we can see, and that span this 800 year gap, um, and that allow us to provide the missing constraints and try to understand what he was describing. He's referring to something that we can see now um, in terms of understanding um, what he was telling us about. So that's quite a detailed look at what we did with um, the De Calore and the De Irrigate. I'll pass back to Giles just for some final statements. <coughs> Thanks. So it's really just to wrap it up and to bring us back in some senses to Greyfriars and the experience of the Franciscans of Gloucester. So he's a great thinker, he's original, he's thinking through problems and using observation, if not experiment in our way. He's also inheriting a very long tradition of thinking about light, colour, natural phenomena. We might take this statement from Augustine's Confessions, and I think it's easy to think about Grosseteste, Aristotelian, and Grosseteste, uh, the user of new knowledge. He's also a profoundly Augustinian thinker in a very creative way. This is Augustine in, in Book 10. For light, the Queen of Colours, suffusing all the things I see wherever I am abroad in daylight, entices me as it flows before my sight in all its variances, even though I am busy upon something else and not observing it. For it works its way into me with such power that if it is suddenly withdrawn, I desire it with great longing, and if it is absent for too long, it saddens my mind. Grosseteste writes this astonishingly mathematical beautiful treatise on the rain. In the Chateau d'Amour, that text that he writes for the Franciscans, he ends up with, and the Chateau d'Amour is an allegory, the, the castle is the Virgin, this is the Virgin Mary, this is a, a great beginner of that tradition of the Marian stronghold against the temptations of the world. And at the end of it, in the system of his Franciscans, in Grey Friars, he has the Virgin clad in a rainbow. I think we'll, with that we will come full circle. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Giles and Hannah, for an illuminating um, <laughs> at uh, the personality of Gross Test. I'm going to struggle to get Grey Forest Bobby out of my head. It's like wishing he hadn't said that. <laughs> but, um, you know, encapsulates there. Um, I think we've had, uh, in past uh, talks as part of the Westgate Archaeology series, we've had uh, a look at the buildings and daily life of the friars. Um, we've got as far even as talking about studies and libraries. And I think what you've done has shown us uh, some of the cutting edge, the real cutting edge research and the thinking and teaching that was going on there. And um, much as a uh, you know, very informed audience, this is Oxford, I think if uh, Grace Test is well known, he's known as a theologian and not as a scientist. And um, this has given us a whole other look at such an important person nationally and clearly, well, obviously, at Oxford. Will you take questions? <laughs> Uh, that's 
fascinating talks. Thank you both. Um, just another speculation on the Crescentist's concept of light. He, he is clearly aware of the medium. To what extent might that be anticipating the concept of the ether? I mean, he, he knows about the ether in terms of cosmology. So when he's doing his diagrams of in, the, in the sphere, where the spheres are that form it. Um, so I think he has a profound sense too of what different media consist of. So when he's talking about the rainbow, he has these graded media. So when the rays come in, you have an interface between air, the cloud, an interface between denser and, and, and more dense and less dense. Also. It's not specific about the ether, but I, mean, I think there is that sense of relation. So, he writes a treatise on light in the UK. And I think one of the very striking things about that treatise is that um, the property that he holds as being most important about light is its space filling property. And he says that light is what gives solidity and extension to matter. He uses light as a way of solving the um, atomism problem. Um, and so he's not just thinking about light in terms of what he can observe, but that he, he really is um, giving it a lot of important physical and metaphysical properties. So, um, one of the things in terms of describing colour perception is that we often do that um, using colour terms. And across many languages and many cultures, um, there is a certain um, categorical description of colour that says, you know, group this variation in colour together and we see these variations of colour and we label them as green. Um, so there are definitely, in that continuum of colours that you see in the rainbow, you tend to group them into um, seven colours. Um, now, it is actually one of the modern questions in colour perception. What imposes those constraints and why we, why we group colours in the way that we do? Um, but just in pragmatic terms, in terms of communication, people group them into those that sort of number of chunks. Um, and so it might be a representative green that Aristotle had, so he's a leek green. Um, and the green in a rainbow, um, if you took you know, a primary example of a rainbow, it might be similar to Aristotle's colour, but the modelling work on the rainbow suggests that actually you can produce all sorts of variety of greens. It is sometimes a bit of a nightmare with translation, so when we're doing the day reading section, you <coughs> use hyacinth, blue, and kinthos, but that can mean blue, purple, yellow, green, or brown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which source you look at. We went for purple. <laughs> I've got a sort of bit of a naive question, but um, clearly the Franciscans were extremely interested in this light and I think of Roger Bacon's work on optics. Are there, is there any kind of speculate what, what drew them to this particular field of science? What, is there something in sort of medieval curriculum that could naturally draw them towards that sort of theological point of view? Or obviously you talked about the metaphor of light. That's extremely good question. <laughs> and we could be give us fuel for another couple of seminars. I think. <laughs> no, it's a really good question. Um, and it's something that Grossetest is particularly associated with, but he's not unusual in that concentration. So it's a metaphor that derives its power from the biblical beginnings, so both in all the New Testaments. Um, so it allows you to talk about metaphysics and physics. You've got big inheritance of optical learning from the ancient world 
its mediation to his Anglican and Jewish thinkers. And this is really coming to fruition in the 12th and 13th centuries. So this is the, the sort of beginning of sustained study of optics. And that's what Roger Bacon is very interested in too. I think there's something too as to why Gossetist is using that loosened vocabulary for Franciscan preachers, that this is about Light's property of, of formation, and that the Franciscans are there preaching and forming the Christian community. So it, it's an extremely pliable, it's both real and a metaphor, so it's a, it's a kind of grand metaphor. So I think that's, that's sort of, of that answer, but I mean, it's also, you can find this back in patristic writings and you'll find it again in 18th century writing. So I think it's a continuum interesting in this particular expression in the 13th century. I suspect because of the interest in Oxford. If that is the beginning of the Can I just ask, one that I've kind of thing about, it's a history of science question actually, which is, uh, obviously Roger Bacon was his pupil. It's whether there is a science school and what his legacy is or how far it stretches. In funny ways, so Bacon, uh, who probably was still a um, is very, knows his, his mathematical abilities and then totally disagrees with him in the main things. So this is an interesting point. Bacon doesn't like reflection, he goes for reflection. Um, the question of continuity, so is it, it's a very interesting one. Um, the posterior analytics commentary does remain a standard text, that's the one that keeps getting referred to throughout the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, there are bodies of collections of Gossetist scientific works and they tend to come in clusters and in groups, so these are being deliberately collected together. There's an Oxford revanche at the end of the 13th century and the <coughs> one in the 1360s after the Wicklified controversy, and the last moment seems to be Thomas Gascoigne in the 15th century. There's other areas too, so there's a series of manuscripts in Prague, and whether that's connected with um, the later medieval um, expansion of Prague as a centre of scientific learning, whether it's something to do with the Book of Light texts, which are really from even the Book of Light to the Hussites and Bohemia, is an interesting one. And then we have a late sequence of Italian um, collections, and it's interesting that these are collected together. So I suspect um, he's a complicated. Uh, medieval reception is complicated, so you know, Thomas Aquinas in the 14th century doesn't have the cachet quite that he will in the 19th century. So you know, somebody that you think is going to be popular all the way through the middle of the 19th century isn't. But in Gossett's case, I'm sure that the, the fact that his library is next to him, I mean, that's extremely important. Yeah, so I think that's it. Well, thank you very much, um, both of you, for coming along. Really, really fascinating indeed, and uh, um, it will be uh, very interesting. In fact, I'm just wondering how we can keep in touch with the Auditors of the Universe project. Well, we're based in Durham and in Oxford, so we have a nice website. Yes. <laughs> www.auditoruniverse.com. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in the Northeast, um, you will see results of the project it's displayed on the cathedral as part of Lumia Durham. So that So it takes research from our Institute for Computation of Cosmology and Modeling of Galaxies and it intersperses that with the medieval imagination and what the medieval cosmos is. So it's called the World Machine, which is a phrase from Russell <coughs> Stadium. So, yeah. Plug, plug. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, if everybody would like to join me in just saying thank you all for time. <laughs>